So, Dr. Terry Newell. Um, Dr. Terry Newell uh, is a, a very unique individual, and probably there is no one like him uh, because uh, this issue of government ethics uh, is uh, a very, very uh, complex area. Dr. Terry Newell spent a large part of his thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Terry Newell spent 40 years working in the United States government service, uh, first with the Air Force, then with the Department of Education, and then uh, with the Executive Service Training Program in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, and in Charlottesville, uh, Dr. Uh, Newell served as the, the dean uh, of uh, faculty uh, at uh, and worked on this question of ethics, and developed a course uh, on leadership and, and, and democracy uh, for essentially the United States Civil Service. So there are very few people that have this kind of experience and, and understanding and knowledge. Of the ethical issues that we all deal with, or you do now, no, I'm sorry, I don't deal with them the same way, uh, on a daily basis. So we have not just experience and knowledge, but we have wisdom in Dr. Terry Newell coming back to us for the second time. The first time was speaking truth to power and surviving that. Uh, and also he spoke about the important need truth to power, of the need for the creation of an ethical environment in which truth can emerge and, and serve our interests. Today he's coming back uh, for another important piece, which is spotting and solving ethical in the workplace, and again, surviving uh, and doing well and prospering and making for a more vibrant uh, organization. So again, thank you, Dr. Newell, for coming back uh, for a second time. Thank you, Dr. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be with you. Can everybody in here back hear me all right? It's progressing good. Thank you. Uh, and since this is a long room, uh, and I hope we'll engage in back and forth today, Especially if you do this in the back, uh, please, so everyone can hear you. Just you know, when we have a question or a comment, just uh, speak up and we can capture it. Also, you may notice uh, the session is being videotaped, so that's so others can benefit by it. Uh, however, we have one, one ground rule we're going to observe, which is at any point, if you want to say anything that you don't want on the tape, just say, stop the tape. Uh, and that part will not be taped. Because I want you to feel comfortable. You're the key audience uh, for me this afternoon. I want you to feel comfortable talking about whatever you want to talk about on this topic of uh, solving and, and resolving ethical dilemmas. Okay, so um, I invite your questions as we go along. Um, I think uh, I'll do some things to make this interactive. Um, and so please please get into it with me, with each other, because the last thing you want to do is listen to me drone on for the next two and a half hours. I mean, just take it, that won't be that much fun, and I won't do that. Okay, so um, I want to start um, by offering a, a kind of a perspective on ethics uh, that to me frames what I'd like to talk with you about uh, this afternoon. And that is that um, all of you probably, um, because it's required of all federal agencies, all of you probably go through some ethics training. The Congress has mandated all federal employees get one hour of ethics training a year. The Office of Government Ethics has uh, 109 pages of federal ethics laws, and many more pages of regulations to back that up. Uh, everything from conflict of interest uh, to financial disclosure and, and the Hatch Act and so forth. All of that is, is terribly important. Uh, nothing I say this afternoon is meant to say it isn't important. But those aren't the ethics things we're going to talk about today. Um, because in, in my view, that's ethics uh, focused on, on knowing what you're not supposed to do. Uh, what I want to focus on with, with you today is what do you do when ethical issues come up and there is no law or regulation to guide you. Okay, so that's what we'll be focusing uh, today. So to give you, a, I want to start with a few examples. You have copies of all these slides, but I want you to have to write stuff down. So let me just go through a, a few examples briefly. You, you probably all know, because this is in the papers endlessly, that the Veterans Administration started, I think, in, in the hospital in Phoenix. Uh, schedulers uh, for veterans were falsifying wait times uh, to make the numbers look good to, to Washington, that veterans didn't have to wait too long for, 
for care. There was no law or regulation that prevented them from doing that. They clearly should not have done it. It is an ethical violation. Okay. Give another example. Uh, General David Petraeus, at the top of his profession, not only in uniform, but then as director of the CIA, resigned uh, over a, an affair he had with his biographer. Okay. Again, no law against that. Uh, certainly wasn't expected of somebody in the military or in a high CIA post. Again, an ethical failure uh, for someone uh, who, uh, until then, had a, a brilliant career. Uh, very recently, uh, you know the Flint water crisis, Flint, Michigan. Uh, it's mostly a state and local uh, uh, problem, but the EPA in, in that region got into it. And in fact, the EPA regional director uh, resigned because of it, because it turned out that uh, a, a scientist uh, in the EPA had done testing of the Flint uh, water supply, found there was excessive lead in the water, told his boss that in the EPA, and the EPA didn't want to confront the state and local officials, so basically uh, just played down the problem. And again, a big ethical lapse. No law or violation prevented that, or could have prevented that. And then one you probably have not heard of, uh, it's a little hard to see this, but maybe you can see it on your material, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, Army War College did a study last year and came out with the title, Lying to Ourselves, which I commend them for actually uh, putting that as the title of, of, a, of a major report. And what they were talking about was, was the fact that uh, over recent years, and this probably will not sound at all unfamiliar to those of you in, in, in the foreign affairs community, but in the military over recent years, they've had more and more demands placed on officers in the field and fewer and fewer resources. Uh, those demands require reporting to Washington that you're complying with them. The people in the field couldn't figure out any way to get them done, so they started lying and just signed off on things that they hadn't done because they knew they were expected to. That wasn't the surprising finding. The surprising finding in this report was the people in Washington getting these reports knew people in the field were lying to them. And they just went along with it, uh, which the authors of the report called mutually assured, mutually agreed deception. Uh, and again, no, no ethical law or regulation would have prevented that. A huge ethical problem. So those are the kinds of things I want to talk about. What do you do in those kinds of situations? So, um, some objectives for our time together. Basically, uh, what I want to do with you is, uh, is talk about what do we mean by ethics anyway? Uh, when you think you spot an ethical dilemma or problem, uh, how do you go about understanding it to figure out what the right thing to do is? Uh, when you think you've figured out the right thing to do, what do you actually do? Uh, because what you'll find, and probably what you've already found in your experience, is sometimes people decide what the right thing to do is, but then nothing happens. There's no follow-up, there's no implementation. So I want to talk uh, some about that, uh, how to act on it. And then we're going to finish, uh, finish our time together um, uh, looking at, at three kind of traps that as human beings we face in making really any decision, but I'll talk about it in the context of ethical decisions. Just because if you're aware of these mental traps, hopefully you can avoid them. And why do I think this is important? It's probably pretty obvious by now, but um, if you look at, um, this, is, this is data from a, a question asked at least every two years uh, by something called the National Election Study. Sometimes it's asked by other pollsters. And the question is, to what extent do you trust the people in Washington to do the right thing? Uh, and what you're seeing are the percent that say uh, most of the time or just about always. Now, there's some, some good news and some depressing news in this. In this. Uh, the, the, the depressing news is pretty obvious. Uh, the fact that the, the, the trend of the graph has gone consistently down since the late, uh, since the early 60s, really, um, which is to say that there is a big trust deficit among the American people. Probably no news to anybody in this room or anybody walking down the street here, uh, given the, the current election cycle and everything that's being said all around. Uh, but that's an issue for any of us in public service. If we lose the public's trust, we're in deep trouble. Okay? There is some good news, and the good news is that it wasn't always that way. As you can tell, in the late 50s, early 60s, 67 percent of the American people answered positively to this question. So there's at least some room for growth. Uh, but ethics, I think, and, and the fact that if people don't act ethically in government, uh, that contributes to that problem. Okay, so far? All right. Uh, 
Uh, so I want to start by showing you a video clip. Now let me give you the, the setting for this, uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, run the clip. Uh, this is uh, a video clip from a movie called The Dish. Uh, and just to, to explain uh, what it's about, that's The Dish, uh, the radio telescope. And the setting for this uh, film uh, is uh, in 1969, July specifically, uh, when the first American uh, astronauts landed on the moon and they're getting ready to walk on the moon. But this dish, located in Australia, uh, was supposed to point toward the moon to receive the television signal of the first walk on the moon. Um, and so the whole world could see it. And so what you're going to see in this video clip is uh, the supervisor of this crew of technicians handling this radio telescope. His, his name is Cliff. And Cliff and his team are running into a problem. Okay, so as you watch the clip, what I want you to think about it is if you were Cliff, what would you do in this situation? So let me run it and then we'll talk about it. Ten, we start the dish. That's point nine. We've got to be point east. We understand that now. GD forecaster says it doesn't make sense. Great. You say anything else? Just hello and goodbye. Very polite. <laughs> Thirty knots can't be uh, the absolute max. No, it's a theoretical max. So it's never been tested. No. So now the dish can take more than we don't know. Quite frankly, I don't want to know. There's a thousand tons above that azimuth track. That's not good. All right, let's just... We've got nine hours to live on. This thing blow itself out, but... Yeah, really could. Yeah? Cliff? Bob? Just ringing to say good luck. No, oh, hang on. There in a minute! It's a bit breezy this morning. That wouldn't affect... Right. What happens then? Oh, I see. So... You reckon? Yeah. Crikey. Back to a special day, Bob. Yep. The was first arrived in Parks, where he was greeted by United States Ambassador Mr. Howard Hutfield along with local dignitaries and townspeople eager to watch the historic lunar landing. This is Cliff Buxton, the director of the facility. Oh, yeah. Uh, Governor General, that was the official opening. Why did they decide to build a thing here? If I may, Bob? <laughs> Weather, Prime Minister. Park says this sort of stable climatic conditions conducive to the operation of large-scale radio telescopes. Fit 30 knots. Then get back to the bureau, will you? Sure. What's up? Get relaxed, Rudy. What's the bell for? This is now it's windy. Well, geez, I could have told you that. It's blown a bloody gale outside. Hold on a little, Liz. Oh, well, the ladies helped with hanging all these. No, hold on. Your dish. Thank you, Prime Minister. And uh, congratulations on giving the nod. Party needs performance. How are they going out there? Oh, good, good. Perfectly. We sit here on our asses for five bloody days, not a breath of bloody wind. Then on cue, out of nowhere, just when it's our turn, a bloody cyclone decides to park its ass at us. Um, sorry, lads. <clears throat> just... I'm just going to check some, some bloody thing. Yeah, it's all going well, though. Obviously, nothing's foolproof. There's always limitations. Well, there are no guarantees, all things considered. <laughs> Life, I guess. You're joking, aren't you, McIntyre? <laughs> yeah, everything's fine. 
You know, McIntyre, we have a saying in the party. You don't fuck up. Eh? That's it. <laughs> Armstrong's overruled the sleep break. Armstrong's overruled it? Still NASA, we don't want to sleep, we want to walk. Look, that Armstrong, he goes for it. Ruby! When do they walk? Soon. Now. So we're up the hook? Yeah. Both started having relay problems. They want us off when we start. But how? We don't even see the moon until 1 o'clock. 12.56. Well, whatever. Come 12.56, if Armstrong hasn't walked, this dish got to be pointed at the moon. Okay, ready. No one this place is locked down. I don't care who turns up, no one gets in. You understand? Yes, sir. We're going to have to move this dish. There is a safety issue, Al. I understand that. We're under no obligations in these conditions. Match what will happen. Don't I? What do you think will happen? It's a big sail area. The wind grabs hold of it. We wait. They're going early. It could happen any moment. Come on, quickly, you'll miss it. I'd do the same. If I just landed on the moon, I wouldn't want to be sleeping. It's like telling a kid to sleep in Christmas morning, I had. <laughs> More tea, Prime Minister? Oh, yes. Lovely. Oh, they're going early. Yeah, I know. Are you all right? I am now. Sorry? Goldstone can take the pictures. Goldstone? Can't move the dish in this wind. Good Lord. But hopefully it'll die down. They'll be able to use us later. Oh. Still, it would be nice to have been there from the start. Oh, it doesn't matter what pictures are called by who. We're part of the team. That's the most important thing right now. Yeah, you're right, Maisie. Sure, Bob. Well, at least the boys at the dish will be able to relax for a while. Mitch? Getting worse, it's gusting to 50. You can't move this dish. The DKS video, Houston TV, net two. DKS video, boy. We still got relay problems with Goldstone. It looks like we need you as a prime receiver. Probably. Well, the signal between Goldstone and Houston is dead. It's gone to ground somewhere, and it's currently still go for walk. Roger, Houston, uh, we'll advise when in position. Uh, Roger, DKS. As soon as possible, please. Well, Glenn, come in. Mitch, talk to me. It's shaking like this in the upright position. Yeah, what do you say? It's not designed to take these sort of forces. It collapses. Just the wait, 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 wait. Some damage. Watch what you say. Well, it could collapse. Man's about to walk on the moon, and he still will. But no one's gonna see it. Al, let's be clear about this. There are five lives at risk here. I'm responsible for those lives. Now, most people would say that's sufficient reason not to move the dish. And everyone will accept that. But will you? simple example of that distinction, but it's a distinction that's often missed, because a lot of management decisions have ethical components to them that people don't always see. If you think of the Veterans Administration, it sounded like management stuff. How do we get these wait times down? It had a huge ethical dimension that people weren't realizing. Uh, same with, uh, I don't think I put this example, but same with the IRS, remember the, the trouble they got into about 
uh, approving the, uh, the status of Section 501c4 organization. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it started out as a management problem because there was a huge number of applications. How are we going to process these in time? What they didn't realize is when they started setting up criteria, there was an ethical component to that decision. They were blind to it. Okay, I mention that because um, the stuff we hear usually in annual ethics training and laws and regulations is just the tip of the ethical iceberg. Okay, it's, it's in some ways the easy part. At least we know what we're supposed to do and not do. It's the stuff underneath the waterline that, that can get us in trouble. And oftentimes that part of the iceberg is swimming around and, and cloaked in management kinds of issues or technical kinds of issues. And so we don't always see. Okay, so here's, I asked you to think about if you were Cliff, what would you do? So what's the answer? If you were Cliff, what should you do? This is the part where you get to participate. Yes? Send them away and move it myself. Send them away and? Move it myself. Okay. Uh, assuming that he could do it alone, that could be a choice. Yep. Okay. What other? What else could he do? Or should he do? Okay. Uh, so, and, and what would he say to NASA? Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting. He hasn't done that, at least not so far. Is a suggestion back here. Yeah. So he could he could ask the employees, say, "Hey, you know the situation. People are counting on this, but it's dangerous. Do you want to say?" So one is he could just send them out, not give them a choice. The other is he could give them a choice, so that at least. If it crashed, and as they were gasping the last breath, he would have you know, the satisfaction of knowing he would join. I'm asking if they're willing to stay or if they want to stay in that situation, and it's not really giving them a free choice. I agree. Because? Because they're under professional pressure, they're under peer pressure, uh, they're all men, so they're going to show up for each other. Uh, so they're going to be an awful lot So there's, there's a risk in that, that what sounds like a reasonable approach and, and more ethical than just making a decision for them has some trouble in yeah, it. I mean, in, in a way, ordering them to stay would be more ethical because then he as the leader is accepting the responsibility. Ah, okay. Okay. Good point. Yeah. Things, uh, those are great points. One of the things I, I want you to always be aware of is that when you face an ethical dilemma, if you say, I've got to figure this out by myself, I can't talk to anybody else, I can't ask anybody else for help, you really own that. And oftentimes, there are other people that have responsibility. Uh, you had a great suggestion, call NASA and, and say to NASA, hey, blowing, blowing a bloody gale out here over in Australia, 50 miles an hour, it's dangerous to raise the dish. NASA might come back and say, yeah, but you know, we're counting on you guys. Goldstone's gone to ground. We've got another way to show this. And then you might say something like, well, you know what, NASA? If we raise this dish and it kills all five of us, uh, what are you guys going to say? Go ahead. Ah, okay. So he could ask his boss to pull it up and buy it. Could. Boss is willing to risk our lives for what's good for us. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, we built it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now they're going to talk to the American taxpayer. So uh, Cliff's got a number of choices here. We'll look at, we'll, in a couple minutes, we'll look at what he does. But I want to now ground this in some ways that uh, people that uh, think about eth the ethical part of this decision uh, can think about it. So uh, this, is, this is literally going to be your five minute introduction to Western philosophy on uh, ethics. Uh, and that's probably all you want is, is five minutes, but um, it, it's helpful nonetheless. So uh, at least in Western philosophy, there are three primary schools of thought around ethics and ethical decision-making. 
The one goes all the way back to Aristotle, uh, who said, um, if you want to act ethically, that's a matter of sort of personal character. Uh, what kind of person do you want? Ask yourself what kind of person you want to be, and what would a good person do in this situation? Uh, and Aristotle uh, had a little more to the argument in which he said, what you want to do is always aim for the midpoint of behavior, the, sort of the golden mean notion. That is, you don't want an excess of behavior, and you don't want a deficiency of behavior. So, for example, if Cliff, Cliff wanted to be courageous as a supervisor, just to pick one character trait, uh, courage might be the midpoint. Uh, recklessness uh, would be the, an excess of that. Uh, and, and timidity or cowardice would be the deficiency. So Aristotle says, look for the midpoint. Look for what a virtuous or a good person would do. That's one way of looking at it. Okay? And it lasted for a long time uh, until we got in, into the Renaissance and then this guy Immanuel Kant came along and said, it doesn't matter what kind of person you are. What matters is what principles ground your thinking, your ethical decision making. And he said there are two core questions to ask yourself around that. And the first one is, um, am I using people as an end in themselves? I should never use people as a means to an end. So going to Cliff's situation, what would Kant say to him in this situation? Yeah, you can't risk the lives of five people because you're using them as a means to another end. That's wrong. Okay, Kant also said, if you have a principle, you have to be willing to apply that principle universally to all situations, to all people, everywhere. Otherwise, it's not really a moral principle. It's just sort of convenient for you. So, for example, imagine yourself in the checkout line at the supermarket. Okay, and the bill comes to eight fifty, and you give the cashier a ten dollar bill, and the cashier gives you eleven fifty in change, mistaking the ten for twenty. So you could say to yourself. You know, I've been shorted a lot of times in the checkout line. This is, yeah, this is sort of the karmic payback time for me, and I'll just keep the extra ten dollars. And Kant says, you can't do that, because that's you wouldn't be willing to have that principle applied to yourself. Uh, and if the whole society operated that principle, commerce would break down. So that's Kant's way of looking at it. And then the, the third way is a guy named Jeremy Bentham, who said, I don't care what your moral principles are. I don't care what the consequences are. What's the greatest good for the greatest number of people? The most pleasure and the least painful way to decide. It. So, what would that tell Cliff to do? Okay. Well, it, it, I, I, he might. If, if that's the only way he were thinking, he might say, "Well, the whole world wants to see this. There are five of us. The greatest good is the whole." I mean, that, we might find some problems with that, but he could try and defend himself. But the thing is that the whole world is going to die. Yes, true. And if it crashes, the whole world isn't going to see it either. And I think, as you or someone pointed out, the greatest good for the greatest number sounds easy. It's not so easy, because if the dish collapses, one can imagine not only do five people die, but his boss loses his job, the prime minister is in real hot water, the town loses the radio telescope and all the income from that. Uh, they got to pay back the loan that the Americans gave him to build it, whatever. Uh, so the greatest good the greatest number isn't always clear. So now you're wondering, all right, you've given us three ways to look at this. They all have problems with it. And that's true. They all do. Uh, so uh, what I want to commend and recommend to you is when you think about an ethical situation, think about it from all three vantage points. Because they each bring a different way of thinking to it. And they each sort of give you another way of looking at it. And any one of the three by itself can get you in ethical trouble. So for example, if you only think about it like what would a good person do, you, you sort of get on, you know, on your high horse and say, well, you know, I, I can't be bought. You know, this is, uh, any of you watch Downton Abbey? I guess it just ended. Um, you know, uh, Maggie Smith plays the Dowager Countess, I guess. A, a, a few episodes ago, she said something um, to Mrs. Crawley, I think it is. This crawl was going on about the hospital needs this and the hospital needs that, and Maggie Smith said, you know, it must be cold on the moral high ground. Uh, I love her lines in that series. That, that's the danger of, of only thinking this way, okay? The danger of only thinking from the standpoint of principles is you can get pretty rigid. 
Okay? I mean, in the classic example of that is Adolf Eichmann. I mean, he actually defended himself at his trial in Jerusalem by saying he was a Kantian. Okay? I mean, that's a distortion. That, you know, he obviously used people as a means to an end, and so he didn't do his homework too well. But I mean, that's the danger of, of that, and the danger of, of thinking only from the standpoint of the greatest good from the greatest number could be kind of self-serving or expedient. So uh, what Jim Sparr, the guy who came up with this notion of the ethical triangle, is, is look at it from all three vantage points and then try and figure out what the best thing to do is. Okay, and you've come up with a number of, of great suggestions. A uh, number of things Cliff could do. I'm now going to show you what Cliff did, and then you can decide what you think about his ethical thinking in this situation. I'm going to leave the lights up because this is part You were right, Cliff. This is science's chance to be daring. If we don't move this dish now, it may as well be rubble. Al, I still think 11's a lucky number. Where? What? Sometimes you've got to take a risk. Cliff, he goes for it. From north to... Alright, we may not like that cliff so much because he went for it, but in any event... Um... <laughs> yeah, so... Um, but let's put aside for a moment the fact that he got away with it, which he did. We all saw that. What do you think of his decision making? I like that. I just, the team. He, he didn't make the decision. Okay. He followed everyone, which is something that we, we strive for in our workplace. Okay. So, so he, did, make the decision. he did at least, it seems, try not to use people as a means to an end by asking their opinion. But uh, you made a good point that when you ask well, let's, what do you think about how he went? Do you think they were all equally, yeah, let's do this? No. Okay. Yeah, he, he didn't get asked at all. Yeah, he didn't get asked at all. And the guy in the green sweater, I don't know if he had a name or not. I mean, you can tell him what. Uh, like, uh, so there's a danger in, I mean, maybe if you'd given him a piece of paper and had a secret ballot, it might be a little more defensible. But, I mean, his defense, he, he at least got their input, but that's tricky. You've got to be careful about that. What he didn't do uh, is a number of things he could have done, which you suggested that he didn't think of. Most especially call NASA or talk to his own boss or the prime minister. Uh, because they bear some of the responsibility. Uh, and he's given them an easy out, basically. Would you think that would be one person trying and possibly the prime minister got to shut down? Yeah, that was, that was Cliff's immediate boss. Right. Bob, I think, was his name. Yeah, he did get shut down. And, and so we might imagine Cliff talked, he's already told his boss there's a little bit of a problem with wind, but he said to his boss, this could result in our deaths. And it's not clear what his boss would do, uh, whether he'd be willing to go to the prime minister. But in any event, he had other choices, and that's all I want to focus on. All right, I want to leave this example and actually go to another one. Any last thoughts on this? So the bottom line is um, ethics um, basically is asking yourself a set of questions. So far, at least, at least three vantage points. And then trying to find a solution uh, that honors what you've learned by looking at it from these ways. And we'll go a little further than that with the next case, but that's where we are so far. Okay, you have a case um, in front of you called Bill White and the Veterans Administration. I want to give you about three minutes to read through that case and then ask yourself as you read through it, if you were Bill White, what would you do? So give you a chance to read it and then we don't. Got through the case, and need a little more time? Okay, so um, here's the first question. If you're Bill White, I mean, you've got a lot of things on your plate, and now you're acting administrator of 
the Veterans Administration. You hope you will be picked to head the agency. Why don't you just hire Bob Smith and be done with it? Qualified? Okay. Any other reason? Okay. Okay. So there are some reasons not to. So um, why don't you just tell the White House, this young whippersnapper in the White House, <laughs> back off. This isn't going to happen. Why doesn't he do that? got a lot to lose by just saying no. Okay? So um, this, uh, this uh, is an ethical dilemma in two, two standpoints. So let me, uh, let, let's explore that for a minute. Um, earlier I, I said there, uh, the, tip of the, the top of the iceberg was uh, violations of law and regulation. That's what in this framework from uh, Rush Kidder uh, are, are called moral temptations. There's a rule, there's a law, there's a regulation. And basically, this is a conflict between moral and immoral values. So there are basically our civil service merit system rules that sort of prevent um, Bill's, uh, Bill White from just hiring this guy flat out. Okay, he's got to follow certain rules and just giving him the job that the White House has said to give him is a violation of those rules. So he really can't do that. That's a right versus wrong. There's, uh, and, and so there's only one right answer. But the fact that he can't do that doesn't seem to relieve him of the ethical dilemma uh, because he's also got concerns about just saying no. <coughs> Not just concerns for himself, as we'll, as we'll find out. So this is more of a values-based decision. It's a conflict between moral values, uh, which we'll, we'll get to a little more deeply later. And it's a choice between several courses of action, all of which might be legal and ethical. Okay, Cliff in the, in the, the dish had several courses of action he could have taken. None of them would have violated the law. That doesn't mean they were all good decisions. Uh, and so your conscience comes into it, and then there are two and usually more than two right answers. Uh, and that's the, that's the realm uh, we're going to be dealing with. But I want to, before we go further with this, um, let's look at this in a slightly different way. So if you were Bill White, who's got a stake in how you decide this and what you do? Okay, you're certainly uh, your, your, uh, your former boss, Jack Goldman, who's actually now left the agency but left it with the threat of blowing the whistle. So you can't ignore the fact that that could happen if you're not careful. Who else has a stake in it? Senior executives and the Senior Executive Association. Ah, okay. Uh, so, um, other senior executives uh, and, and, and then the Senior Executive Association just sort of looks out for these sorts of things. Who else? Okay. The veterans. Sorry? The veterans. Yes, uh, certainly um, the veterans. I mean, we know from the case that. Um, Bob Smith, you know, is highly regarded in the veterans community. He's done some good things, might be able to do some more good things. The institution itself. Meaning the Veterans Administration. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and what's 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 the stake of, of the Veterans Administration? I think the reputation. Yeah, it's a, it's a reputation. Um, yep. Just getting back to you mentioned Jack Goldman and his previous boss. He hasn't exactly been a good example of leadership. No. <laughs> Supposed to be for it. Yeah. Well, and, and Jack Goldman would probably defend himself by saying, I'm a virtuous person. I don't put up with this kind of nonsense. So he's not willing to think about it past then, and that's a danger. Yeah. Bill White's family. Ah, all right. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Bill 
White's got, got a family, he's got people that depend on him. They have a stake in this because if he handles this the wrong way, uh, he's in trouble. Um, and that's going to affect him. Good point. Yep. <laughs> yes, uh, the White House. Um, there are actually several people at the White House. There's the first one that, that Bob Smith contacted, and then he delegated it down to the head of the personnel office who delegated it down to whoever's handling it now. So. Yeah, sure. Well, he's obviously got a stake because he wants to do things for veterans. Okay? Anybody else? Yeah. OPM has a stake because they're watching it from a merit system standpoint, and they don't want any monkey business going on with this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> who, who he would work for. Yeah, thank you. Actually, you know, I've done this case several times, and you're the first one that's ever brought him up. Uh, or her up, we don't know who it is. Um, I mean, I don't want to get somebody that might, I mean, Bob Smith might be, might be a nice guy, but he doesn't know anything about medicine. So, yeah. Congress and the taxpayers. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so, is, and is Congress of one mind here? Is Congress ever of one mind? I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a veterans committee who sort of likes Bob Smith, and then there's a post office civil service committee that's watching out for. So there's, there's several people in Congress, and then you said also the taxpayers. Oh, the taxpayers. We won't tell anybody outside this room that we put them on last. But yeah, sure. I think this is kind of a tempest in a teacup, to be frank. Okay. Because we all work for the State Department. We know that political appointments are facts of life. We have to live with Bob Smiths in our offices. And the issue comes down to, well, he's not qualified for that job. Find him one he is qualified for. Okay. I was wondering about that too, but he's not being appointed. Do you think someone's pressuring him to hire him? Who the yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're going to come to solutions in just a moment, and those are some really good points, so let me just hold off on those just for a minute more. Uh, but as you can tell, a, a, a colleague of mine once, uh, once said, a lot of things that on the surface seem like these sort of nasty little management problems all of a sudden expand into the whole Madisonian system of government. And you get everybody except the courts involved in this, and who knows, they could get into it too. Uh, and that makes them tough. And what also makes it tough is that just about everybody up here has a valid point of view. Okay, there's, I mean, we could go through and say what value matters to each of these people. Well, uh, for Jack Goldman, he's, that value says matters to the merit system. You can't violate the merit system. Uh, for the White House says that merit is, uh, you know, we expect you to be loyal to us. Uh, we want to be loyal to Bob Smith. And there's nothing wrong with that value. Doesn't mean that ought to be the governing value here. Uh, OPM's concerned about the merit system. Uh, uh, Bill White's concerned about his career and his family. There's nothing wrong with that. That's also a value that has to be taken into account. So there's a lot that goes into that. And um, Whenever we look at, at an ethical dilemma, uh, it helps to say who are the stakeholders uh, and that, what values do they represent because behind every ethical dilemma, or the mercenary ethical dilemma, is a conflict in values. And that's what makes it a dilemma. And so what you see up here are, are just three columns of, or three different ways you might, might look at values. And this is by no means exhaustive. I just didn't want to make the slide even more cumbersome than it already is. But you could say in this case, OK, there are some constitutional values, like due process here, uh, and separation of powers, uh, perhaps responsiveness uh, to uh, officials, their organizational values, the chain of command, the efficiency and effectiveness, the good of the service, um, using the taxpayer dollar effectively. Uh, there's a conflict between truth and loyalty and the personal value side. Uh, the truth is the matter is the guy isn't qualified, but I, yet I want to be loyal to the White House if I can find a way to be. So in every sort of ethical dilemma, there are value conflicts and sometimes several value conflicts. And so, one of the things you, it forces you to do is say, what, who's got a stake? What are their values? And now, what, what do I need to do about that? So now let's go to the solutions part. Uh, so 
we already had uh, one thought, which is just give the guy some other job. Was that, I think, what you were suggesting? the White House sort of, I was going to say request, what does the White House demand? Yeah. Okay. Um, well what, what do they care most about? Getting him, getting Bob Smith a job helping veterans. Okay, they, you're right, they have requested this specific job, they even had OPM add to the SES ceiling for it. Uh, but th th there's an assumption that Bill White's got to be careful about, which is the assumption being that's the only job. Okay? Uh, and that's oftentimes you need to test those assumptions, which obviously he hasn't done. Uh, yeah? Could, could he ask the White House, if this is so important to you, why don't you appoint him? Ah, all right. There's another solution. Uh, he could say to the White House, uh, how might that conversation go? So he's, we, we left the case, he's on his way to the White House. He's, he's got to meet with this person, uh, and the person says to him, well, look, you're going to hire this guy or not? And so you might say, <laughs> okay. and, and, and the White House guy might say, well, why should I have to do that? Why not, I mean, he wants to work for veterans, why don't you hire him? So what would you say to the White House person? Let me put him someplace he fits. Okay, you might say that. Go ahead. I think it's your obligation, if you are negotiating this with the White House, to um, explain the equ other equities involved. Yes. Uh, Bob Smith is not the only person in this. He's not the center of the universe. You've got all these other people depending on you. You are in charge of a huge bureaucracy yourself, and there are many other equities and stakeholders. So yes. it's incumbent on you to lay these out for the whippersnapper in the White House. Yeah, so, so you might say to this person in the White House, look, um, let's think about it this way. If I go ahead and hire Bob Smith for the job you want me to hire him for, and did you know that the White House, the, uh, the House Post Office Civil Service Committee is already poking around in this? Do you want that coming back to the White House? Okay. Do you want the unions going to their members of Congress saying you're violating federal law and merit system and how you hire people? And, and my guess is the person in the White House would have a little pause about that. Okay, so there is that is a course of action you might pursue. Um, what is? Um, let's step away from solutions for a minute. What is Bill White's job in this situation? Okay. He's got to protect the injured and serve veterans. But what does he have to do in this situation? What's his job? Okay, but even even broader than that. Consider whether that clause is really needed to target a risk for him. Yeah. See, I'd argue, yeah, go ahead. His job is to make sure his organization stays effective, valued, uh, with some integrity, all while somehow working through this problem. Okay, because he, he could just, as we said, he could just say no, but he knows also he's going to pay organizational costs for that and maybe personal costs as well. Okay, so uh, any other solutions? We've come up with a number of good ones. What? Um, go ahead. Go on. No, I just, it's a personal story. I, I, when I worked at the Pentagon, I had a similar situation of a well connected but singularly unqualified individual who the administration wanted to be involved with in the IT in our case, mm -hmm. the prevention personnel first.
Put him in a job he's not qualified for. Yeah, yeah for that's sure. A, I mean, yeah. the waste, the waste that's right. It would be a waste. Yep, that that's would right. be an effort. Yeah, go ahead. So, am I the only one who's seeing an opportunity here? I'm thinking, oh. here's a guy who's well connected and got, you know, the year of all these people, and he wants to help veterans. And yeah. ultimately, I'm here to help veterans too, right? So, why not bring him as a special assistant, assign him to do the job he is hopefully qualified to do something? But he'll also be the liaison between yeah. these groups. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I mean, who, who is who is the only person uh, that Bill White hasn't talked to yet? Bob Smith. Bob Smith. Okay, so he might get him on the phone. And he might say, hey, this is Bill White, the Veterans Administration. The White House is uh, encouraging us to bring you on board. We hear a lot of great things about you. Uh, let's talk a little about uh, what you might be able to contribute. And in that conversation, I mean, He'd be stupid, I think, to say, would you like to be the deputy of the chief medical examiner? Uh, but he, he, could, he could probe the guy for what he could contribute, and then he'd go back to the White House and say, hey, I talked about it. He'd love to do something like this. And by the way, if we have him do this, we could probably legitimately put him in a Schedule C job, or you, the White House, can hire him and send him over to us to do this work. Whatever. I mean, there are other ways to get through this. I think that's a great idea. That oftentimes, in a problem, there is actually an opportunity. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so I want to move away from the case. Um, uh, I knew somebody was going to ask what happened. Uh, when I read this case, I, I knew the guy who wrote this case at Harvard, and I said, called him and said, what happened? He says, he's not, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, because the whole point of Harvard cases uh, is that uh, if, if you know there's an answer, then everybody says, oh, well, that's pretty obvious. He should have done that. I don't know what happened. Hopefully, he, didn't, he avoided the, the two extremes which is to just say no or hire him for a job he's not qualified for. Um, and the, the last point I want to make before I move away from the case is, is that um, in an ethical dilemma, there are rarely just two choices. Okay, please, uh, please keep that in mind. In fact, um, if it looks like a dilemma, what, um, what Rush Kidder says is find at least a, one trilemma option. And you've come up with many good ones, certainly more than, than the started with. Okay, so um, what did we just do in these actual two cases, with the, the Cliff and, and Bill White case? What was the process we used? Okay, so we did some brainstorming. What else did we do? We various aspects. Okay. Okay, so we looked at various ways the dilemma could be handled, sort of said, well, this has these positives and these negatives, pros and cons, yeah. Identified the stakeholders? Yeah, we identified the stakeholders because you don't want to be blindsided by somebody that you forgot to consider. Because remember, whatever solution you come up with, it may not fully satisfy these people, but what you don't want to do is end up in a situation in which you hadn't even considered what their concerns are. What else? Uh, we identified logical fallacies. Yes, and logical fallacies and assumptions that are buried in there, like it's this job or no job. And in fact, it could be some other job. Yes. Look at looking at it from different vantage points, not only different ethical vantage points, but vantage points and values of the stakeholders. Yes. Uh, always press for options. And 
And this is one of the great values, by the way. Um, there's no way for me to know this, but I would guess, at least, that um, there are some options that came out in our discussion that individually we might not have thought of. But then when somebody else mentions, yeah, that, that makes some sense. And that's the value of getting others involved also. Uh, one of the dangers, and, and this, is the, this was the problem Cliff had, he didn't talk to anybody else. So he didn't get anybody involved. He didn't get any other perspectives. Uh, and that's, that can be dangerous. Now, I know sometimes when you're facing an eth ethical dilemma, you feel you can't really talk to people you work most closely with. You might get in trouble, or, or they might go talk to somebody else. But usually you can find somebody, even if it's outside the organization, to just bat this around with and help yourself think through it. And that, that gets to be important. It's a great idea. So again, just keep those process things in mind. OK, so I'll mention a few things just to sum this up, and then we're going to take a short break. Um, so one thing we did, uh, and you can do always ask, is what sort of values are out there, and uh, what might those value conflicts be? Uh, and there are all kinds of, of values that exist. We've looked at many of them, uh, not all of them, certainly. Uh, and then uh, the notion of exercising moral empathy. Um, and this is connected to something called moral imagination. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, we're used to doing what's on the left side of this slide, looking at it from our vantage point. Uh, but the value of doing this kind of stakeholder analysis is that allows us to begin to think about how do people in other vantage points see this? What values matter to them? What's at stake for them? What options might they see that I might not be seeing? And that moral empathy <coughs> gives you that moral imagination, the notion, the, the ability to conceive of things, to imagine solutions to this problem you might not have thought about otherwise. OK, and then um, in, the, uh, in the book you have in Appendix B, I think it's uh, page 189 that starts, uh, there's an ethical decision-making model, much of which we've already done in, in work of this case. I uh, just wanted you to know what's in there. Uh, and, and so uh, in the simplest form, first question you ask yourself is, this is, is this a rule-based or values-based dilemma? If it's the right versus wrong, you do the right thing. Or you get yourself in a pile of trouble. If it's right versus right, then you've got uh, three steps to go through. Fact gathering, identifying options, and then making an incremental decision. And the fuller model in, in, the, in the book uh, goes beyond what I'm putting up here. But uh, these are the kinds of questions you can ask yourself. Or if you're getting with a group of people, that a group can ask itself. And I think we did most of these. Um, even this notion, what are the relevant facts? And sometimes we assume things are facts. Like uh, Bill White assuming as a fact that he either hired this guy as deputy to the chief medical examiner or he didn't hire him at all. And the reality is that's not a, a fact, it's an assumption. And it's important to distinguish uh, between them. Okay, uh, and then uh, when you make an implemented decision, uh, you do want to be concerned about who's not going to be happy with it. Because oftentimes it's an ethical dilemma, somebody isn't going to be happy. Uh, you got to think through how am I going to mitigate that downside? So um, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, it's five after one. We're going to reconvene at 1.20. Um, that's 15 minutes. What I need you to do is another case study on your table. Uh, it's, it has to do with Frances Perkins, who was the first <coughs> woman to be named to a cabinet level position. So uh, we're going to take 15 minutes. During that 15 minutes, please just find time to read through that case study. And the front page of it will tell you sort of what to think about. So we'll pick up again at uh, one point. And I think this is also a good example of, of someone who faced an ethical dilemma, which on the surface might not be so apparent. Uh, like nobody was asking her to do something wrong. Uh, but the fact is she was faced uh, with something she really wanted to accomplish and a fair amount of opposition. Um, a boss, the president, who uh, expected a, a fair amount of loyalty as she has the right to expect from an appointee. And so she had to sort of deal with all that. So uh, the question I want to ask you, and let's just sort of talk about this, is what struck you in this case about how Frances Perkins managed to accomplish what she did accomplish? Yes? Yeah. How do you pull the paper ego out of it? Because it's a lot of nothing It does. 
Yeah, a couple, couple of very important things there. Um, I would say she subordinated her ego. She, she had an ego. I mean, she really wanted to get this stuff done. It mattered a lot to her, but she knew how to sort of keep that in its place to accomplish something, and the humility goes with that. Great point. Other things, yeah. I, I think she knew how to read her audience very well, but then also I thought it was brilliant how she gauged the president and made sure that there was no ambiguity as far as repeating something to him two or three times and then not leaving the meeting until she was completely certain that she had a commitment. Yeah, she, she really studied uh, her, her <coughs> immediate boss, as we might say, to know how to approach him uh, and uh, how to make sure he held to his commitments. Because, I mean, she kind of, I mean, as you can tell, in the one case where he tried to back off, she went right out uh, and reminded him, and he backed off. What else? So I didn't have a chance to train her, because I'm not that old, but, but clearly she, in her head, she went through the kind of thing we did, like, you know, who are the key players here? What do I need to know about them and learn about them? Yeah. What else? because she knew that Rose of the FDR didn't like the notion of the dole. She told her that. And the other is that that's a tip she got, the taxing power, which incidentally is the way the current administration defended itself with the, the, the health care laws. It was a tax, and they wanted to do a tax. What else? And she was persistent. She was persistent. She brought it up all in yep. she, every meeting. And she was willing to take time, not an unlimited amount of time, but like her first few meetings in the cabinet, she kept kind of quiet, you know, and spoke last, and then just kept sort of you know, putting her points in there to make sure that they heard it time and again. Yep. There's a real power in what she did because if you stay quiet in a meeting and then they come to you and you speak once, you get a reputation for not being someone who interrupts, you get someone who's always going on. And she brought it up every other meeting. So she wasn't coming across as a, she, she knew how to play the room. And, and we talk about this being shy and retiring, but there is power in someone. Yeah. And there is power in always being the one who picks when this conversation is going to come up. Yep. You speak, if you only speak occasionally, you get, tend to get oftentimes listened to more carefully. Yeah. She knew that men were easily manipulated. <laughs> which, which, you know, when I read about her and the fact that she kept this thing notes on the mail line, I really wanted to get a hold of that. I haven't found it yet, but I'd love to know what's in there. But obviously, she learned some important lessons. I'm sorry, let's go here. Again. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, she was willing to compromise. Not so much her principles as um, sort of flipping things around in a bill. I mean, with, with health care, she eventually had to back off because that was a political thing that just wasn't going to go. But yeah, she was, she would sort of push, let people push back and knew when to bend and not break. Yeah. She understood the power of the chair of the committee. Yeah. How to use them to, you know, get bills support and inclusiveness, but how not to let them take over. 
issue <laughs> and uh, drown it or suffocate yes. it or yeah. whatever, redirect it. Knew, knew both the power and the danger. Yeah. And also knew how to hold their feet to the fire, like closing the door and putting a bottle of whiskey on the table. Yeah. Uh, she knew the power of selfie. Probably more on the latter. Uh, I, I would guess. Um, but but she was also being honest. I mean, she was letting FDR know the political price he could pay for naming her. But I think she probably knew him well enough to know that he was going to go ahead anyway. So yes, it was a pretty astute thing to do. Okay. Anything else, just in terms of yes. Well, the, the, the ethical is, is the values involved in that. So it's, it's uh, for example, truth versus loyalty. In other words, they ex she needed to speak some truths about the situation she saw and what needed to be done. And she knew they would be expecting her to follow the chain of command, to be loyal to the president, to, to stay in her place as a woman you know, who's new to all this. I mean, they, she had to be careful about crossing some lines that they expected. doesn't mean they were right to expect them, but they did. So that, that's part of it. Yeah, part of it also, I think, was, was the fact that um, she had a strong achievement motive. I mean, one of the value, I mean, she wanted to get a lot done. She was pretty clear with FDR at that at the outset. And so the ethical dilemma for that is, uh, I want to get all that done, and now I've got to be careful how I go about it so I don't push so far that I really work against myself. So it's, it's, it's more than that. It's not a right versus wrong so much as how she had to approach the different values that she was facing. Does that help? Okay. I suspect she also went through some ethical calculation when she decided to drop the health insurance trust bill. I'm sure it's something that she wanted and she saw the value in that part of the bill. But then she had to balance that versus you know, getting values there could be effectiveness, because adding the health thing from her vantage point would round out the, the worker protection she wanted, and it's sort of against also her desire for achievement, that if she continued to hold to that and didn't find some way around that could sink the whole thing. So yeah, there were some choices she had to make. So I want to uh, step away from the case a little, um, and um, So um, the reason I, I put this case in is, is that sometimes people make ethical decisions. She didn't have any problem making a decision about what she wanted to get done and knowing what she was going to confront. Her question was, how do I go about this? 
what tactics do I use to accomplish what I want to uh, in this situation? And a guy up at Harvard, Joe Bonarocco, wrote a nice little book uh, called uh, Leading Quietly. And what he meant by the title, what he means by the title is the fact that we often think of people who are acting ethically as <coughs> reaching a decision and then sort of drawing a line in the sand and say, I know the right thing to do, and by God, I'm going to do it, and, and sort of don't try and change my mind. And what, uh, what Father Rocco says in his book is, there may be some times in your career where you need to do that, but probably not as many times as you think. Because once you draw that line, um, you have to be prepared to cross it to lose your credibility. And if you cross it, you may lose your job. Uh, and so his point is, we don't need as, as much of that as we do uh, need people who are quiet heroes. That as they go about getting done what needs to get done, quietly, without ever getting to the point where they have to draw that line in the sand. And so he suggests eight tactics, and I just want to run through them here, because I think that they, they make sense uh, for any of us in, in public service. Uh, and, and the first one, he says, is uh, don't kid yourself. What he means by that is uh, don't assume you know everything there is to know in the situation you're facing. If we think of the Bill White case, for example, Bill White didn't know everything he needed to know. That's why he needed to talk to Bob Smith, for example. Right? He needed to get more information. In the same way that uh, uh, Frances Perkins, at the outset, didn't know everything she needed to know. She didn't know how to get past this dole, this uh, don't want people on the dole issue that FDR had. Uh, so don't kid yourself at the outset that you know everything you need to know. You probably don't. Uh, the second is, uh, it's OK to have mixed motives. So um, in the Bill White case, it's all right for Bill White to be concerned about his agency and also his job and his career. Okay? Don't get yourself in a situation which you say, uh, the only thing I care about is the good of the American people and anything else doesn't matter. And that, that, I, I don't want to dissuade anyone from caring about the good of the American people, but uh, keep in mind that probably other things going on with you too. And it's okay to acknowledge those. Okay? In the same way that Francis Perkins wanted to get certain things done, uh, but she also um, wanted to be sure that she did that in a way that didn't ruin her career. Uh, she did uh, run into some problems, not so much over this as some things that happened a little later, especially when FBI was around. But okay. okay um, also, buy some time. Uh, this is something that in the dish, Cliff didn't do. Okay, well, actually, he did. He bought some time because he just delayed, uh, but he didn't use the time, okay? And that was his mistake, okay? So um, there are very few ethical dilemmas you're going to face in which you have to make a decision right then, okay? There are some. Um, I, I was in a seminar once with some folks from the CIA, and they said, somebody comes to the door looking for one of my agents, and he's there. Uh, I can't say, I didn't think about whether I want to tell you he's there or not. I just lie and say he's not there. But there are very few of those kinds of dilemmas. In most cases, you've got some time, use it. Uh, that's the mistake, by the way, that Bill White made. Bill White took, was it, weeks? But he didn't use that time. He just sort of let the process go on without trying to manage it at all. Uh, so um, buy some time, and then invest your political capital carefully and wisely, because you only have so much. Because that's the point we're getting to over here. Yeah, is, is that um, you can only go to the well so many times uh, in which people start writing you off as a, either a constant complainer or a troublemaker or whatever. And I'm not saying not to find strategies in cases that trouble you, but um, be mindful of the fact that when you invest political capital, you need to do it uh, carefully uh, and, and choose, your, choose your battles, I think is Father Rocco's point. Uh, and then drill down, which means gather information. Learn more. Talk to people. Uh, see what the, the weak points are, strong points are, who might be your supporters, uh, who you can count on, what, what possible solutions won't fly politically, what solutions might work. Uh, so uh, drill down, gather that information, and then be willing to bend the rules. And Francis Perkins bent a fair number of rules here. A lot of the rules on what was expected of women high positions, the chief rule being we don't expect women to be in high positions, 
sent that one right off the bat. But, but even after that, um, and then other rules about uh, what kinds of proposals I can put forward, what I can push the president to do. So, so bend rules, um, and then be willing to push, test, escalate, um, get people to move off of places they might not originally be comfortable with, and ultimately look for a compromise. Does that make sense? I think that's a lot of what was going on in, in this case and should have gone on in the other two cases, uh, which weren't managed nearly so well. I think it's what she handled it. Okay, I want to look at this from one other vantage point, but I need to. Uh, so when we tend to think of the organizational hierarchy, Wherever you are in that hierarchy, um, let's, let's put somebody here, there are always going to be people below you, people laterally, and people above you, okay? uh, even if you're at the top. Uh, and sometimes uh, when I'm working with people, I use this notion of uh, called leadership at the T, the letter T, is that when you rise up the organizational hierarchy, early in your career, it's sort of your technical skills that enable you to advance. And then you may get in a supervisory or management position, and then you need a new set of skills, and then eventually you might get to the top of your organization. Okay, and that's where strategic thinking skills and, and some of those more influencing skills are, because when you get up here, and that's where Francis Perkins was, the cabinet secretary, um, yeah, you can, you can order people below you to do some things, and sometimes they do them, sometimes they don't. You can't order any of the people who are lateral to you to do them got to influence them. So a big part of her task in this case was how do I influence people that don't have to say yes to me? Okay? Um, and so whatever your positional power is, uh, is generally not going to be enough, especially for a tough ethical dilemma. And you're going to need something called social power. Okay? And social power, you can look at it's composed of these four things. Okay, one, uh, and, and I think all of these showed up in Frances Perkins' case. One, as a number of you pointed out, she had a lot of interpersonal skills, a lot of emotional intelligence. She knew how to read people. Uh, she worked, had worked with FDR for a long time. She understood him. Uh, she kept notes on uh, how to work with men especially, but in general in those situations. Uh, so she had a lot of emotional intelligence. That's a source of power that can be very handy when people don't have to do what you say. Okay. Also, information. She just had a lot of information about the issue she was working on, just as the nature of because she was a cabinet secretary. But that's true for any of you, whatever job you're in. There's a certain amount of power that comes to you from your access to information. You know, the old phrase, knowledge is power. I mean, you have it. That's a way to influence people. And then there's associational power, or the power of social networks. She had social networks. She had a vast social network. Not only FDR, but she knew his wife and his mother. Uh, she knew uh, famous uh, uh, writers, uh, Jacob Rees and, and so forth. And she knew that whole community. Uh, she knew the community working in her field from a broad array of experience. Uh, so the power of your social networks can be very helpful. And then expertise power is, is really the, the mastery of the specifics of a given situation. You have that as well. And when you have those sources of power uh, to add to whatever position of power you have, it can be a lot more effective. Does that make sense? Okay. And oftentimes we don't think about that. We think, well, my position, I'm only allowed to make these kinds of decisions. Uh, but uh, you've got a lot more power than just your position gives you. You just have to think about how best to use these sources of power. It can be really powerful. Yes. I think for us uh, that associational power uh, is key uh, because so much of our work is done as is removed from Washington while we need decisions or replies or something from headquarters. And if you know people or people know you, you are much, much more likely to actually get a response than if you're simply using your positional power and saying, you know, I'm the admin officer here and, and this is the issue and can you please provide guidance. Uh, if you 
writes to someone you know, even if it may not be that expert you need, you're much more likely to provoke action in Washington. Yes. Uh, so that personal network and, and that ability to draw upon it and reciprocate it. Sure. You know, if those people need something from you, you better be prompt in getting back to them. Yes. Uh, In fact, um, it's also important in another way, maybe you were suggesting this also, which is the, the fact that you have those networks and that people in your organization or above you or in Washington know that you have those networks also increases your power. Yes. Okay. So thank you. That's a good point. Okay, does that make some sense? Okay, questions before we move on. So again, these, these are just um, things to keep in mind when you've made an ethical decision, and now you're saying, well, how do I go about implementing that? It's to use these, uh, these, those eight tactics um, and use social power to get things done. I think that's what Francis Perkins was able to do quite powerfully in this case. Okay. Um, and then sort of lastly on this point, um, it's, it's also the notion of, of voicing your values. Uh, when you uh, make an ethical decision, you are making that in part based on values that matter to you. The question then is, how do you communicate that? And unfortunately, what happens in some situations is people make an ethical decision, and they can't find a way to voice it. Okay? And, and so uh, the decision sort of lays dormant, or it's ineffective. And so Mary Gentile um, at the Babson College wrote a nice little book called Giving Voice to Values. She, she's found the same thing in her work, which is a lot of times people don't engage those they need to engage because they don't know how to get the words out. Okay, it's like you, you get into situations that feel tongue-tied, and you know what needs to be done, you just don't know how to say it. So she has several suggestions, some of which we've sort of encountered already, the notion of enlisting allies. That's one way to help voice your values. Another is uh, keep in mind that um, when you're working with, with other people, if they feel their status is being threatened, they're going to oppose you, okay, usually, unless they've got the kind of humility that we were talking about, which not everybody has. Uh, so, uh, in, in fact, I um, came across some fascinating brain research. Uh, you know, they can now um, use something called functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, so, literally look at what's going on in your brain while you're doing certain tasks. One of the things they, they did is they, they looked at um, people who were in physical pain. They wanted to see which part of the brains sort of light up, you know, which means neurons are firing, and people in physical pain. And then they looked at people who were in a group situation and were getting sort of ostracized in the group. And what they found out is the same areas of their brains were firing that fire when they're in physical pain, which means literally ostracism or threats to your status hurts. Literally, physically hurts. I'm not feeling physical pain, but it's the same thing going on. And so, uh, what you want to try and avoid is feeling people's status as being threatened. So, if you actually, if you go to page uh, 125 in here, it happens when you write a book and start memorizing pages. And there's something called uh, guidelines for loyal dissent. A colleague of mine put those together. And it's a, it's a nice way, I think, to think about the steps you might go through in dissenting without trying to threaten someone's status. Okay, now, as you get further down the steps, you, you, you may you know, not be able to avoid that. But um, let's see. Step one, shoot your issues carefully. Um, step two, don't shoot from the hip. Uh, step four, don't personalize the challenge. Uh, step six, especially, don't paint your superiors in the corner. I mean, those are, that, I think that's, that's good advice. Now, sometimes you, you can't follow it, but I think more times than that, you probably can. Okay, a, a couple others, uh, and there was a great example we had just a few minutes ago, and thank you in, in the back. Um, this notion of reframing a problem as an opportunity. 
And, and that's a great way to, to get support. It's a great way to get allies. Uh, and then think about the rationalizations you're going to hear. Because oftentimes when you've decided on an ethical course of action, you know, somebody's going to come up with a reason why you can't do that. Okay? And it's going to sound very reasonable to them. Uh, and, and I'm not saying maybe they don't have something worth listening to. But oftentimes it's the rationalization. Ben Franklin, ben Franklin once said, uh, it's an amazing thing, the reason we humans have, because it allows us to come up with a reason for anything we want to do. Uh, and, and that's the danger of rationalization. So you want to think about what you're going to hear, and then prepare. What are you going to say if somebody brings that up? Okay, and then a whole range of levers that you can use. Uh, I just listed some of them here. I won't go through all these, but going down to the third one from the bottom. The dangers of inaction. Sometimes people won't want to act. You can point out to them, hey, if you don't act, things are actually going to get worse. That's what happened to, to Bill White. He didn't act, and things did get worse. Uh, finding actionable alternatives. Pointing out to people the full cost that could come if we don't handle this properly. So again, there are a lot of ways you can think about. And then play to your strengths. Okay? Every single person in this room is different in terms of the strengths that we have. It's important to know those, it's important to know things that you don't feel are your strengths. I'll give you an example, in my case. I don't like um, interpersonal conflict. It's not that comfortable with it. It's not that I never get into it or won't do it. It's not a strength of mine. So knowing that, I, I'm facing enough of one. I want to find a way, if I can, that I don't have to take someone on personally one-on-one -on -one, uh, in a conflict situation. Okay? Some other people are very good at that. So again, that's me, but other, everybody's going to be different. Know your strengths, and then um, most importantly, practice. Like any other skill, being able to voice your values in ethical situations takes practice. We don't, we don't get good at it until we practice. So what do I mean by practice? I mean if you're preparing, let's say, for a conversation with a colleague or, or a superior around an ethical issue, You've gone through these steps, then literally, you know, pick a trusted friend, maybe someone at home, and say, I want to play out this conversation. So here's what I plan, and then literally see yourself, hear yourself getting the words out. Because once we do that, we start getting more comfortable getting the words out. It's the fact that we don't hear it that makes it difficult. Okay? Yes? Well said. I mean, you, you, not just strengths, you've got to know what, you know, what your weaknesses are and, and be prepared to deal with both. Exactly. Okay. Um, and then lastly, the notion of, uh, on this, the notion of moral courage. Because there are situations in which you will have to exercise moral courage. And what do I mean by that? Uh, again, I, I, I like uh, Dr. Kidder's model. It says it's, it's really three things you want to pay attention to. One, what are the moral principles at stake? And being clear in your own mind what those are. The second is knowing what the dangers are. Dangers to you personally, to your organization, to your reputation, to your job, to your access to resources, whatever those dangers might be. And then third, uh, having a way to press ahead even though you're aware of those dangers. And if you have all three of those uh, and you are pressing ahead, that's moral courage, the definition of courage. Uh, now, that's different not quite the same if you only have two of them. So if you know the principles, for example, uh, and you know the dangers, but then you don't do anything about it, that's sort of being timid. Okay? And if you know, on the other hand, if you know the principles and you rush ahead and you've never even thought about the dangers, that's probably being foolhardy. Okay? So you want to avoid that. And then if you, have, if you know the dangers and, and you press ahead, 
But there's no moral principle at stake. That might be physical courage, but probably not moral courage. Okay, does that make sense? So, um, so we think of, I used this example this morning, we think of, uh, of a bank robber as having physical courage, because the bank robber knows the danger, probably. Most of them think. Uh, goes ahead anyway. There's no moral principle at stake. Of course, unless you're John Valjean or maybe the robber and you're stealing bread because your family's starving. And then there is a moral principle. Okay? Actually, I actually encountered this most strongly uh, once hearing the Commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, former Commandant now, Governor Chuck Kulak, and we invited him down to the Federal Executive Institute to speak. And before he came down, he said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, whatever you'd like to talk about, we'd be delighted to hear. So he, uh, he came down, I didn't know what he was going to talk about, but he came down and he said, I'm going to talk about moral courage. Because in the Marine Corps, that's a central value for us, the importance of moral courage. And he said, a lot of people think in the Marine Corps it's physical, that we're all about physical courage. He said, and of course we are, but the physical courage comes from having moral courage. So it's the precursor to it, not the result of it. That's true for anyone in law enforcement. Okay, I, I want to ask you to do something just for a few minutes at your tables. Um, let me explain it first. So, if any of you are sitting alone for this exercise, you probably want to just join the table so you're not by yourself. Um, we, we've talked about a, a lot of um, strategies, techniques, ideas, tools uh, for both understanding, thinking through ethical dilemmas and resolving them. Uh, what I want to do now is uh, engage you a little bit in thinking about the Foreign Service and, and the kinds of, of things that would help you use those tools and concepts and the kind of things that block you from doing that. Uh, this little technique, by the way, is called force field analysis. It's a very old technique, but if you've never heard of it, the notion of force field analysis is that wherever you are at a given point in time, the current status of ethical behavior is sort of uh, a point of equilibrium between helping forces uh, on the left, helping you get better at ethical behavior in the Foreign Service, and restraining forces, things blocking you from getting better. And so the idea of force field analysis is what are those helping forces, what are those restraining forces, and once you know them, you can try and use or increase the helping forces, you can try and weaken or get rid of the restraining forces. And then that point of equilibrium moves over to the right. So um, just in your tables uh, for the next, let's just say, you know, five minutes, and have a conversation about what some of those helping forces are and what some of those hindering forces are. And then we'll just sort of open it up and talk a little about that. <coughs>
Okay, uh, I, I need to interrupt your conversations, primarily in the interest of time. We promised to get you out of here by 2.30 and I want to honor that. Uh, this is clearly an activity that we could spend a good two or three hours on. I mostly just wanted to introduce you to it and at least get a few examples of both these helping forces and hindering forces up, just so you can see what can come out of these conversations. So, uh, anyone, just uh, what? what Okay. So a strong sense of personal value. And, and of course, one way to, to even add to that force is to uh, select people that have a strong sense of personal value into the foreign service and reward those people that have it. Sure. Another, another example. Okay. That's all right. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I don't mean for hindering. I mean for helping. But it's negative reasons that help. So fear of discipline, fear of the Washington Post, and fear of screwing up in your confirmation hearing before Congress. Okay, I'm just gonna. Uh, fear. Because there could probably be a lot of others, but those are great examples, and that can be a helping force. If, if nothing else, to remind people that might not want to act ethically that they better be afraid of that, okay? I mean, that's what Bill White should have done with the White House, is made him a little afraid of what they were asking for. Yes? Um, we have clear expectations. Clear expectations of? Ethical quality. Okay. The, the rules, the regulations, the expectations of your work performance. And yeah, if, if people, um, role. if people don't understand that ethical behavior matters and is an expectation in their role, don't be surprised if they don't get it. They don't get it, yes? We had on the fostering side, fostering a culture of leadership, and we just pulled out of the hat George Schultz and Colin Powell, who coincidentally were both military leaders. Uh -huh. It's easier than to sort of follow that good example. So, uh, fostering a sense of leadership? Correct. Culture, I'm sorry, culture of leadership. A sense and a culture of leadership, yes. Yeah, the, the reality is that um, you can have the best ethical policies, the best set of values, the best set of best ethic, set of ethical codes, and if leadership doesn't reinforce it, it doesn't do you much good. Yes. I think most people, at least when they first start in the foreign service, are motivated to do well and to serve the country. And so I think that's helping that. Sometimes that might change over time. No, oh, that's not. One of, one of the things that, that upsets me about the way most people come into government, I'm not saying this is true in the Foreign Service because I don't know. I know when I came into the government, when did they ask me to raise my hand and take the oath of office? Sort of after I'd signed the health insurance forms. I mean, what does that say to somebody? Okay.
okay? Whereas uh, the Air Force, just as one example, every time an officer is promoted in the Air Force, they retake the oath of office in a public ceremony. And that's putting some value behind that. Okay, and I think we do, and most people don't even know, don't think about where those words came from. Let me take one more and then we'll get some. best strategies to do that is, is just say no, but if you want to sign off on this, I'd be happy to have you do that. Hard to do when you're a officer. Yes, I know. So what are some uh, things that get in the way? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been straining at the leash. Go ahead. It's your turn. So, um, yeah, if, if an organization says, we want you to raise ethical issues, but there's no way to do that, it gets kind of tough. It puts it all on the individual. And what's the second part you said? No accountability in our evaluation. Ah, okay. What gets measured gets done. Uh, and so if you don't measure, in any sense, integrity, truthfulness, and so forth, openness to dissent, don't expect it to happen. Yep. Well, just as effective leadership can create a form of fostering ethical action, ineffective reporting yeah. is just as the opposite. Yep. That people don't have to live with the consequences. And the opposite is if you start something good and your successor gets all the credit for it. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Why should I do this? This, this comes up a lot in the private sector. <coughs> people make short term decisions, and then by the time the company tanks, they're long gone, having gotten their golden parachute, they're somewhere else. There's one back here? Um, we actually have access to a lot of power. And there are tremendous rewards for succumbing to temptation. To move on, one more. Go ahead. Um, retaliation and yeah. um, punishment. Um, yeah, being afraid that uh, you're going to be alone at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, in, 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 most in most organizations, people can tell you stories about who caught in trouble for speaking the truth. And then if you say, well, tell me about a story of somebody who got recognized for speaking the truth, mm -hmm. it's harder to find those stories. I think they're out there but they don't circulate quite as quickly. So one of the things organizations need to do on the plus side is recognize and, and, and acknowledge people that do dissent productively and, and raise issues. Yep, do you want to say something? Just to keep us still off calendar, it's just going to be after work. Yes, yeah, exactly, thank you. Okay, uh, I, I want to uh, move on to one last topic I said I'd cover before we finish, and that is um, that there are some traps that we are all subject to because we're human living beings. Uh, so uh, what I don't want to do is, is leave the impression that 
acting ethically, behaving ethically, being an ethical government or public servant is all a matter of head stuff. It's just logic. You know, if you're logical and you think all this stuff out, you're going to do fine. It's more than that. So let me uh, get into three ways it's more than that, or three traps you can fall into if you're unaware. So the first one starts with this. Uh, so I need to explain this to you. Uh, this was a study done of uh, it, a three-judge uh, panel in Israel. And the judges were reviewing uh, requests for parole. Okay, so if you can imagine the three-judge panel is sitting all day, and the horizontal axis is uh, from early in the morning uh, on the far left and the far right to the end of the day. And so in a period of time, they're given a, a, a file with a request for parole for a particular uh, felon uh, who's, who's in prison. And they have to decide as a panel, we're going to parole this person, we're going to approve parole or not. Uh, and so what you're seeing on the vertical axis is the uh, proportion in a given time period of, of requests for parole that were granted. Okay, uh, so uh, you see a certain uh, pattern to this. So what do you think is going on? Okay. Yeah, uh, so, um, so the first thing you see is, if you want to get parole, you want to try and get your case handled first thing in the morning. Uh, but uh, decision fatigue is, is what's going on. The dotted lines you see, the first dotted line was a break for lunch. The second dotted line was an afternoon refreshment break. Okay? I mean, the judges, I'm, I'm sure when the researchers showed them this, were appalled at what was going on because they thought it was all being done on the merits of the case. And they weren't realizing that, in fact, uh, something called ego depletion uh, comes into it because even though our brains are only 2% of our body weight, they use a huge amount of energy. And after working tough on tough issues and deciding on parole is a tough ethical issue, uh, you get the energy uh, gets depleted. Uh, and, and the default position is say no. Because you don't want to say yes to somebody that shouldn't get out. So if, if you're tired and, and you don't recognize it, you just tend to say no. And that's what was going on. Uh, so what that means to any of us is that when you're working on a tough ethical decision, be mindful of the fact that it's going to wear you out. And given the time of day it is, or what else you've been working on, or how much stress you're under, or how much glucose you've taken in recently, that can have an impact. You think that's the same when you're sitting on a promotion panel? It could be. So that's the first thing. Just, just sort of be aware of that. Uh, this affects not just ethical decisions, but all decisions. Okay, here's, here's the next one. Um, so imagine uh, this, is a, this is a hypothetical situation that's been given uh, in research all over the world. So imagine uh, uh, there is a train coming down those tracks. There's a Y in the tracks. Uh, and uh, on the left side are five workers. Uh, this is a crude drawing, but uh, the workers have ear, ear plugs in, hard hats on, their, their faces are down the track, they can't see the train coming. That's the operative, and they can't hear it coming. And on the right side, there's one worker, same situation, can't see the train coming, can't hear the train coming. You are positioned by this little thing that is a switch, and you see the train coming, and you know, you shout to the workers that can't hear you. Uh, and, but you notice that if you pull the switch, the train, Instead of going down this side of the track and hitting these five workers, you pull that switch and it goes down and hits that one. Uh, so instead of it killing these five workers, when you throw the switch, it kills one worker instead. So, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you would throw the switch? Okay, so the, the, so the, tra the choice here is you either throw the switch and save five workers at the expense of one worker, or you don't throw the switch and five people die. No, this, unfortunately this research didn't give you a third choice. So just a show of hands, how many of you would throw the switch? 
Okay. All right. That's the first situation. You got to understand. This is this is a research situation for a point, which I I will get to before we're done. Okay. So second situation. Now there's just a straight track. There's no Y in the track. Okay. And there's just five workers on it. Uh, same thing. Can't hear the train coming. Can't see the train coming. There's no switch now, but you're on a footbridge over the track. And you notice there's a 300-pound man in front of you. And if you take your hands and push him off the bridge, he will fall on the tracks. The train will hit and kill him, but it will save the five workers. So how many of you would push the man off the footbridge? Show of hands. The train derailed and all the people on the train died. Okay, no, this, that's not a choice. <laughs> Okay, uh, so, all right, thank you. So, um, I said this has been done all over the world. Uh, so, uh, before I tell you the results that we, that we found in other places, what's going on here? Are these morally equivalent situations? Yeah. Okay, who, who says yes? And why? Because either way you're deciding on the death of one person. Yeah, I mean, if, in both situations, at least from that standpoint, it's save one worker or five people die. Yeah. I mean, save... Five people, or one for yeah, whatever. I mean, it's, it's one for five is the choice you're making in both situations. Okay? Now, somebody says they're not morally equivalent. Why? Because in this case, it feels like you are killing him with pushing him to death. Oh, okay. Whereas in the other case, it's him, but we have a single train, do something with him. So the fact that we can. So drones popped into my mind, but I don't want to go there. Uh, so the fact that you can throw a switch instead of literally pushing someone makes a big difference for you. Okay. Throw the switch, that's an action. Well, that's what I mean. Okay. In the first case, okay. you throw that switch, you are making a choice. You are you are okay. putting yourself in the position of deciding to live or die. As opposed to you, when you come upon that situation, it's happening. It's not under your control. Eventually, you make a decision to throw that switch, and then it becomes your, you put yourself in the position. Okay, one other point of view, and then I'll tell you what the research shows. Yeah. This is the point which this is the point which I realize how effective I've been today in coming up with other options. This case doesn't have another option. Okay, so in the real world, yes, you would have another choice. Yeah. The switch allows you to distance yourself from the decision making. I'm sorry. The switch allows you to distance yourself from the decision making because actually pushing somebody is different from flicking a switch. Yes. Uh, and, and so, uh, so now I'll tell you what, what the research shows almost, almost uniformly uh, all over the world is just what happened here, which is in the first case, most people, not everybody, throw the switch. And in the second case, most people, not everybody, won't push the man off the bridge. Okay, that's, that's the first part of it. Because something doesn't feel good about putting your hands on another body and pushing them, okay? Now, the other thing that happens is some people in the second case that happened here also do decide to push the person, okay? Probably because they recognize the moral equivalency, that man is still saving five lives. But it usually takes them longer to get there, okay? Because they have to sort of overcome the, the feeling that they're doing something that really doesn't, not right. Now, um, I mentioned punching magnetic resonance imaging before. They've also used that for people going through just this exercise. And here's what, here's what shows up. So imagine um, the bottom part, the horizontal axis, being seven centers in the brain, uh, four emotional ones and, and four in working memory, the neocortex part, uh, and under three different kinds of situations. 
the non-moral situation of the blue bar is something like uh, they give people a description of several television sets and ask them which one they buy. Okay, that what most people are doing then is they're using their working memory to pros and cons of different things, comparing one model to another and its features and so forth. There's a little emotion in terms of what people might like or not like, but it's mostly a cognitive kind of exercise. The impersonal moral situation uh, in this state of data are things uh, like you find a wallet on the street with a couple hundred dollars in it, uh, and there's a driver's license in the wallet, and you're trying to decide, am I going to return this or just keep the 200 bucks? Okay, and now you can see uh, by the, the red bars that uh, emotions start getting more engaged. And then the personal moral situation was literally the pushing the guy off the footbridge. And there the emotional centers fire on full cylinder. So that's a very emotional thing. And uh, the other thing they discovered is that in those kinds of situations, the personal moral situations, uh, the emotional centers of the brain fire before the logical processing. Okay, which means that you are making an emotional decision and then you're using your logic to come up with a reason you made it. My gap is very small in terms of time. That's a powerful thing to keep in mind because that's where rationalization comes in. But oftentimes when we're given all the logical reasons why this is correct, because we made an emotional decision and now we're thinking of using our logic to justify it. Okay, so, um, whoops, where are we at? So the, 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 the trap here to avoid is failing to integrate reason and emotion. Uh, and the people that do decide to push the person off the footbridge have, have gone through that. They've said, God, it feels awful to push this person. But on the other hand, I have to think about what's the greatest for the greatest number, and I'm going to save five lives. So they found a way to do that. I'm not saying the other people are wrong, but just be mindful of the fact that, you, that A, emotions are good, they're not bad. We often think, oh, we're objective decision making. Emotions are good, but you've got to name those emotions and then ask yourself what they're telling you. Okay? And again, that's the value of engaging other people. Because your emotions might be telling you some things that you shouldn't listen to, because you get other viewpoints, you can avoid that. So that's the second trap, just to be aware of the failure to integrate reason and emotion. Okay, is that questions on that? Okay. And the, and the last one I want to give you uh, comes along from, from this. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting little study found that, that people who bring reusable bags to the grocery store buy more organic food. You say, well, that makes sense. They're concerned about the environment. They're concerned about their body. It turns out they also buy more junk food. Balanced diet. Okay. <laughs> why, why, we won't ask you to fess up to this, but why is that? <laughs> See, that's what I mean by rationalization. <laughs> Well, that may be true for some people, but because you've just uh, done something but, good, yes. you've done you've done something good. You're not uh, using plastic. That's it. You're going to reward yourself. It, it's something called it's something called moral licensing. Okay, and, and this is a funny example, but what happens sometimes in organizational life is we go along and tell ourselves, "I'm a good person. I've done the right thing. I did it last week. I did it in this last situation." And so uh, it, it, you know, it's not always. That you're not always aware you're doing it, but then you say, well, in this situation, I can let things slide a little, because I'm a good person. Look at all the good things I've done. That's moral licensing. You have to be careful of it. So let me give you a wider uh, set of data around that. Um, people were given words to use in a story. Okay? And you can see some of the words on the left side of this. So in one case, they were given neutral words. Book, key, house. In some cases, they were given negative traits, as well as greedy, mean, selfish, and some positive traits. And then after they've written this little story, which is just, they just told her, asked to write one to two paragraph story, using these words somewhere in the story. Uh, they were said, you know, uh, we're going to pay you $10 for this experiment. Would you like to donate some of that to charity? Okay. So the, the control group, which was the neutral group, gave on average $2.71. Now, what do you think the people that wrote a story using negative traits gave? actually gave a lot more, almost double. Okay, that's called moral cleansing. Okay, remember Lady Macbeth? She washed her hands afterwards. Moral cleansing. Uh, you, you, even though they didn't do anything wrong, they just wrote a story using negative words. Emotionally, they were feeling, I, I feel
feel bad about this. And so that's translating into giving more to charity. The people that use positive traits, moral licensing, gave the least of anybody. Okay, I'm a good person. I just wrote this yeah. story. And look how good I am. Oh, Jerry, you know, I've really got this thing. Okay? So again, that's another trap. Moral licensing, moral cleansing. Just be aware of it. Okay, so uh, some, some tips is, just as we wrap up. Try not to make key ethical decisions when you're retired. Um, one good, uh, and that goes for your team too, one good way to, uh, to get around that is even, because it's not like you always have the choice to put it off. Uh, sometimes, though, you can say, hey, this looks like the decision we ought to make. Let's revisit it first thing in the morning and make sure we're comfortable with it. A lot of people to get refreshed, think a little more carefully about it. The second is name your emotions. I mentioned them and get others to help you. Be wary of rationalization. Uh, remind yourself of, of the should self. We all have uh, in our minds the kind of person we think we should be. Uh, but yet sometimes in the heat of the moment, uh, that should self recedes, recedes into the background. And we just act based on raw emotion. And sometimes it helps in those moments to, to say, or even before those moments, say, hey, this is the kind of person I want to be. But, so it's sort of a check on and lastly, uh, do cultivate productive decisions. One of the key ways any of us have to get ethical decision making right. So I want to end with uh, a, a, a quote I love from um, Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams, um, as you know, was John Adams' wife, John Quincy Adams' mother. Uh, John Quincy, former Secretary of State, that's what you know. Uh, was 10 years old when she wrote this in a letter to him. He was on his way to the Netherlands where his father was going to negotiate the Revolutionary War. Uh, and Ab Abigail Adams never left the education of her children to somebody else's devices. In this case, she didn't want to leave it to her husband's. But she kept writing them all these letters. And she was just an amazing influence. Sometimes not so great, but most, many times very good and very positive. But basically, this is what she wrote him, to him when he got it when he uh, landed in the Netherlands in a letter. And the bottom line here is it doesn't matter how smart you are. There are a lot of smart people in the world. It matters how ethical you are, your integrity, and your virtue, basically. So with that, I, I want to close the session, but I want to close it with, with a thank you um, from myself to all of you for the work you do for this country and for the world. For, for that matter. It's terribly important. We're all in your debt. I know that taxpayers out there oftentimes don't tell you that, but I'm a taxpayer and I want to tell you that. So again, thank you very much and I wish you the very